for those of you who are guests of Rising Sun, um, you're probably wondering, what's the big deal? He's wearing a Chiefs jersey, big deal, right? Well, I have solemnly sworn to never root for the Chiefs again, because I hate the Chiefs, actually. Um, the reason I hate the Chiefs is because when I moved here in 2014, I was really excited. I've always, I had always been a Chiefs fan, couldn't wait to finally get to watch Chiefs football again. I was up in Minnesota country, so they never aired the games. In the first five weeks of football season in September 2014, the Chiefs went zero for five. And I, I remember watching the game with my son Joe, and I grabbed the remote, and I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm never rooting for the Chiefs again. All they are is a big disappointment in life. Anyone can agree? And I became a Packers fan, right? Because, <laughs> because the Packers were 5-0. and And as soon as I switched, you know what happened that season? The Packers lost five in a row and the Chiefs won five in a row. God's trying to tell me something? I am not a Chiefs fan, but you know what I, am, what I hate more than the Chiefs? The Patriots. <laughs> so it's kind of the, the lesser of two evils for me, uh, but I, I figured I should probably wear the jersey today because I know the Chiefs are going to lose and we won't have an opportunity to... Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, how many of you think the Patriots are going to win? Just like four of us. Okay, how many are Chiefs fans? All right. Uh, you might want to mute this microphone. I'm going to take this. Okay, so for those of you who are watching online, uh, John Ellis, who's a, probably our largest Chiefs friend, uh, fan here at the church, said, I'm not turning your microphone back on. So appreciate you running sound. What you got, Hazel? I don't see it. This, oh, Drew Brees and the Saints. All right, very good, very good. Hey, um, last week we started a challenge. Actually, two weeks ago we started a challenge. We wanted to see how many steps you were taking um, as you, if for those of you who record your Fitbit, we had 10 people participate in that activity. We're asking you to continue to participate in that all the way up until Easter. We're just going to see how far our church has gone from a distance standpoint. And last week, I have some statistics. They're in your bulletin, of course. But last week, we walked as a church 635,000 steps 571, which translates into, if there's 2,000 steps in a mile, we as a church walked 318 miles last week. Isn't that insane? Just 10 people walked 30 or 318 miles, but one out walked everybody. Uh, Tiffany, would you come on up here, please? Everyone give Tiffany a hand. Do you need help walking up here because of how far you walked? Uh, yeah, you're holding your back. You know why you're holding? You walked over 60 miles, not last week, but the week before. Come on up here. Don't be afraid of the light. It's a, it's a safe place. Okay. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to give everyone who has participated, you can only win one time. So, so you won the first one, which is cool. Otherwise, you'd probably beat all of us every week with those numbers. Yeah. So we're going to just, as a way to say thanks, it's a water bottle. It says, Rising Sun Faith, a long journey, better than you thought. So anyway, th would you guys give Tiffany a round of applause? So remember, every week, just turn that into home point. We're keeping a running total. I, I can't wait to see when we hit Easter how many miles Rising Sun people have walked. That's just going to be fun. Now, obviously, we only had 10 of you last week, but if we, have, if we continue to have more, we'll just see kind of where this goes. Um, but as I stated earlier, earlier um, 2,000 steps translates to a mile the national average is 4,000 steps. Most people will walk 4,000 steps in a day, and they'll walk, you know, anywhere from two to two and a half miles a day in any given time. But when we think about how far it was that Abraham walked, this is, it just, we kind of pale in comparison, because this is a man who didn't have a Fitbit, he didn't have a map, he didn't know exactly where it was he was going, 
But when we read about Abraham, if you track the miles, depending on how you track it from Ur all the way to Egypt and then back around, he walked nearly 1,600 miles. 1,600 miles. Now, um, most of us will just track that, that trick from Ur down to Canaan, and that's only 1,100 miles, so that's a little different. But what that translates to is 2.2 million steps. Okay? Now, Abraham was 75 years old when he began his faith walk. Okay, 75 years old. He wasn't some spring chicken. Um, we'll talk a, a little bit about what that translates into for us. But if we take our average, that it's maybe four to 5,000 steps a day, and you use that math against his 2.2 million steps that he would have taken, that, that, and if you kind of figure that, you know what, he's probably not going to be as fit as most of us, and maybe the average, maybe he's a little less than the average because he's a little older, that's going to translate to the fact that he walked probably, if he did it every day, he would, have, he would have journeyed over a year and a half total distance, if not longer. Which teaches us something about faith. You see, faith is not simple. Faith is not easy. Faith is not just right now. Faith is a long, tedious, faithful, pun intended, process. It takes a long time for us to really get from our first step to our last step. You see, faith is a journey, and it, it is a process without immediate gratification. And, and we began that conversation last week, so I just kind of want to hit some high points on what we spoke about to give us context for what we're going to talk about today. One of the things that we, that we suggested that I believe is true is that faith, when we apply it to where we're at in our, our relationship to Christ, faith is about having confidence in what God is and will do based on what he has said he will do. You see, it, it, faith is not, it's not about how far you go. It's about the fact that you are going. It's about taking one more step. So I don't care if you're a Tiffany Quinn and you walk 129,000 miles. We'll celebrate that. But I also would, I would, be, I would just as much celebrate somebody that took 10 steps this week or 11 steps this week. That's a high five moment. It's because you're not standing still. You're not staying where you are. You're taking another step. And just a quick commercial, okay? Back in October, we launched a campaign in our church called the 3D Connected Campaign. We asked families to help us and, and, and kind of uh, partner with that effort to consider technology's appropriate role in our relationship with it and our relationship with God. And we invited families to put a sticker on a calendar that had 90 days. And we just, we asked you to set your own goals. And now's the time this month, the remaining month, that you could turn in those calendars that helps us as a church just celebrate what you did as a family. For those families who s to turn in their calendars, because you probably still have it on the armoire or on the, uh, on the shelf or on the fridge somewhere at the house, if you have just one sticker, we want to celebrate that with you. So please bring those papers in to Home Point the next couple of weeks, okay? So the commercial's over. As it relates to faith, we, we want to celebrate just one step closer to Jesus. We want to celebrate that you didn't stay where you were because faith is a process. It's constant. It never stops. You see, faith is found. We, we read this last week. Faith, um, that, that the first step is always the hardest step with faith. And if the first step is always the hardest step, then that means that the last step, step is always the sweetest step. Right? Accomplishing something. Finally being at the end. Running that marathon, which I've never done, but crossing the line. I have ran other things. I've ran two, three, four, five miles at a time. But I've never run a marathon. But when you have a goal in front of you and you finally take that first step, it's always the hardest one to do. Maybe it's just losing weight. Maybe it's financially getting your books together. Maybe it's relationally getting back restored. Maybe it's from a faith standpoint and you're repenting, you're walk, you, you stop walking in the wrong direction and you start walking in the right direction. Maybe it's just as simple as coming to church on a Sunday. We celebrate those steps. The first step's always the hardest one, but then you just take one more step and another step and another step and eventually those steps just kind of pile up. And finally, we, when you finally take that last step in whatever it was that you have, 
That's a huge celebration. And for us who believe in Christ, we're taking steps towards Jesus in a hope one day that we'll hear, well done, good, and what's the word? Faithful. He doesn't care the distance. He cares the direction. The second thing we, we kind of talked about last week is that faith is really found at the intersection of hope so and be so, and that intersection is joined with the fact that he said so. If you missed the sermon last week, it's a great foundation for what we're doing the next 13 weeks. I'd highly encourage you to go back and look at that. See, we have to get to our last step. And it's the steps in between our first and our last that make faith so hard. Because so many of us stop short of our last step. So many of us have a goal of knowing Jesus more, and when we're halfway through it, we get sidetracked by some famine in our life, or some distraction in our life, or some, some destruction in our life, some death in our life, and we stop short. I, I was so encouraged after last week, I had somebody here share with me a text and says, hey, have you ever heard of this guy, Lou Rudd, before? And this name really sounded familiar, and I, I, I tried to go back to where I had heard that name and I had actually preached on this guy once before. But he did something remarkable recently. This isn't like something he did five years ago. This is something that he just accomplished. And if you type in Lou Rudd in your Google bar or in your search engine of choice, then you're, you're going to find out about a man who has done something that no one else in the world has ever done before. He is the only man in the world to ever traverse across the continent of Antarctica twice. Twice this guy has gone. Recently, he just got back from his second trip. And this second trip was his first solo trip. He did it all by himself. He didn't have any help. He didn't have any sled dogs. He, he did it all by himself with a, bunch of, with a couple of sets of skis and a couple of poles. And he makes this journey that was just a ridiculous amount of miles. Why don't we flip this on? Um, it's, it's 930 miles, and you kind of see the pathway. You guys can look at this, but CBS just did a special on him. You could watch the interview. But here's what he said in, um, in his interview that I just thought was so amazing. He had heard about this other company called the Scott Company at the turn of the last century, 1900s, from England who had decided to try to do this themselves, and they did it as a group. And they found uh, they had different food depots strategically located. People had gone ahead of them to kind of make sure that they were safe. And about every, every 150 miles, they would set up this spot where they could go and finally be okay. If they just made it to the next depot, then everything was fine. But this Scott company fell short of their very last depot by 10 miles and ended up the whole company died, frozen to death. Some smart person way back had calculated that if this company, if Scott's company, had actually just taken 11 more steps every day, they would have made it. And this is what he says. It's hard to see, so I'll just read it to you. But it says, somebody um, calculated, and this, I kind of already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Somebody calculated that the Scott team, the Scott team, if they had taken... And an extra 11 steps every day, they probably would have made it back to the depot and survived the journey. So then Mr. Rudd, as he heard this, after hearing it, he, he thought, when I go on my polar journey from now on, I'm always going to finish skiing for the day. And whether it be at 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at night, I'm telling myself I'm going to take 11 more steps before I put up my tent. And I think that's a great example of what faith is. faith is. Faith is taking another step. It's not stopping short. You see, there's, uh, the, the other thing I loved about this interview was as he was traversing through this continent, this frozen tundra, he had earphones in his ears, and he would listen to things of inspiration. He'd listen to Winston Churchill. He'd listen to biographies written by about Winston. He'd listened to speeches that Winston had done himself. He'd also listened to Mysterious Ways, which is a favorite song of his. And probably the one thing that he, that I thought was the most fascinating is the, the, the one song that would just get him going was Born in the USA. As soon as Bon Jovi started singing, he said, man, my legs just start pumping. 
He's British. What's wrong with that guy? But sometimes several, there are several steps between our first step and our last step. And sometimes in our journey or in our life, it feels like we take one step forward only to take two steps back. See, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain about what we do not see, we learned last week in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Verse 8 says this, that by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went. That's all it's, he obeyed and he went. And then the author says this parenthetical note that I think is so good even though he did not know where he was going. See, by faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in foreign countries, he lived. Which reminds me that, for me, I, I, I can be, I, can, I, I might not know exactly the destination. The destination might be unclear. But you know what I am certain about? My direction. I don't know how this is going to end up, I've never gone on the other side of death. I I have an idea on what the destination will look like. But I'm not certainly clear about it. I, I, I believe it's there. But I've never gone through it. But what I can know for sure is what's in front of me. And if I take Jesus' hand and if I take one more step closer in the right direction that I know he's calling me to, I'm certain of that direction. And I'm going to leave the destination up to him. Some of you are going through hell right now. You're just going through it. And you don't know how it's going to work out. That's faith. If you take his hand, he'll lead you in the right direction. And that, ma- that right direction is mapped out in the word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, David wrote. And so our story continues with this concept in mind that, you know, faith isn't easy. Faith is not convenient. It's not something that's going to be like, oh, hey, i got a field full of lilies and roses and bunnies jumping. That's not what this is. Faith is hard. Thanks for laughing at that. I appreciate it. Because that's how I feel sometimes, right? You, you, you subscribe yourself and you follow this Jesus guy and you, and you go, okay, Jesus, I'm giving you everything I've got. So my life's going to be okay, right? Well, it'll be okay, but it's not going to be easy. But I think sometimes we're misled in this perspective that as long as I have Jesus, man, my life should be okay. And and then when life hits, when you run into that famine time, you start to question, where in the world is God? And that's where we find Abraham right after verse 9, which is where we let off. Remember in verse Um, 8 and 9 of chapter 12, we find out that Abraham is living in between two places. He's living between Bethel, the house of God, and he's living between Ai, the house of ruin. And it says that in Genesis chapter 12, if you'll turn there with me, in verse 8, there he builds an altar to the Lord and he calls on the name of the Lord. That's That's where we kind of left off. And then it says, Then Abraham set out and continued towards Negev. Negev literally means scourged, scorched. Okay, it's kind of this desolate land. I think Abraham just, he keeps walking. I don't blame him for this. Remember, God's promise to Abraham was, this is going to be the land that I give to your inheritance, right? To your sons and daughters. This isn't necessarily the land that God's given to Abraham yet. So Abraham just kind of keeps walking. He keeps just doing his thing. This is the first time in Scripture, other than when Adam and Eve had an experience with God, that we see God literally coming and appearing before a man. And he appears before Abraham. The story continues in verse 10. So let's pick it up. Now, there was a famine in the land. So if God had just brought Abraham to this spot, and all of a sudden we have this big famine, you probably are scratching your head at this point if you're old Abe. You're wondering, well, wait a second, God, this is the spot that's... It's supposed to be something that's a promise to me, but why all of a sudden am I experiencing pain? Very much like how many of you have experienced or entered into the covenant of promise. You've entered into taking another step closer to Jesus. And as soon as you take a step into Jesus, you know what you're stepping into? You're stepping into conflict. You're stepping into war. Because the world and our enemy, Satan, he doesn't like it that you stepped out. So he's going to do everything he can to push you back. You need to get back in line, is what he says to you. So that's why your first step's always the hardest step. It's because you're stepping into enemy territory. 
And as soon as that step is taken, you, ha- you have literally declared war on your enemy. And he's declared war on you. It's not going to be easy. So famine happens. And I'm sure old Abe's probably wondering what in the world is going on. I thought, this was supposed to, I thought we were supposed to put up some tents. So he does what's natural. He's a logical-minded guy. He goes, well, if there's no water here, it, the rest of this verse says, and it was severe. The famine was severe. And, and so Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. This is a logically-minded guy. This is a very intelligent man. He's taking risk. He's calculating the, the risk assessments, and he's going, you know what? This just doesn't make sense for me to stay here. i got to go to, to get some water. I don't fault him for doing this. I think he's just taking another step. Now, this is the first time in our Bibles that we have the word Egypt appear in some Bibles. I got to kind of, we got to circle this word a little bit. Because it's it's the very first time that the Greek translation of another name that we've seen in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6 show up. So if you'll turn there, just go backwards a page or two. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 10, verse, I'm sorry, verse, um, I said 6. We're going to say 13. I said 10. I I apologize. So it's Genesis 10, verse 13. Okay? Yep. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got it wrong again. It is 6. Ha! I was right. All right, so 10, 6. This is the table of nations. And what happens is after Shem, Hem, and Japheth, Noah's sons, get off the boat, we we, we get to follow what happens to the rest of the boys. And so in verse 6, it says, The sons of Ham are, and here's your list, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Many of you in your Bibles, you might have Mizraim be translated a different word. For all of you King Jamesers, I think it's translated Egypt. But if you look down at your parenthetical note, it actually translates it for you and it says Egypt. You see, Egypt's a Greek definition of a civilization that emerges after the table of nations happens. So The word Egypt, the Greek translation of a Hebrew word, first appears in chapter 12. But in chapter 10, we have an indication of where this Egypt comes from. It doesn't just happen. It actually, you can follow the civilization all the way back to a man. And that man is followed through Ham. This is Ham's second son. This is the brother of Canaan. Which kind of puts a whole different spin on where we're at with Abraham as he's walking through the land of Canaan. He just walked through this brother's neighborhood. He just walked through Egypt's brother's backyard. And so now he comes down to the second son of Ham, Egypt, to try to find some reprieve. You know, as we read verse 10, there was a famine in the land, and Abraham goes down to Egypt, and he lived there for a while because the famine was severe. We can't help but just bring the first lesson that we think, I think that we learn in this text. The first lesson is this. I'm going to give you four lessons today with four applications. Here's the first lesson. Stepping into faith doesn't help you sidestep famine. I want everyone to just go home knowing that. That if you're taking a step towards Jesus, know that you can't sidestep famine. In fact, the rest of the Canaanites experience the famine just like Abraham does. But we equate faithfulness with convenience too many times. No one said faith would be easy. In fact, the opposite is true. One of the guys that I love to follow, his name's Erwin McManus, and he has this quote, and I've read it a couple of times in different books, but he has said that he has given his entire life, he's made it his life's mission to destroy the influence of a Christian cliche that many of us are very familiar with. That cliche is the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. See, God would never choose for us safety at the cost of significance, he writes. God created you so that your life would count, not so that you could count the days of your life. And he's dedicated his whole life's purpose to sharing with the church, instructing the church, just just trying to pour out to them and convince them that the safest place is not the center of God's will. That's perhaps the most dangerous place for all of us to be. But it's one of the It's one of the faulty teachings and faulty assumptions that many of us have had. If we have faith, then our life should be easy. But the opposite's true. In fact, you can see this through Jesus' life. In in Matthew chapter 4, right after Jesus was baptized, it says the Spirit, in Matthew chapter 4, led him where? Led him into the wilderness. 
Uh, wait a second, you were just baptized. Now it's like kumbaya time, Jesus. Why aren't we sitting around the fire and singing songs? No, 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 you don't understand. There's, there's trial and temptation right after your identity. And he was teaching his disciples the same thing. Right after the feeding of the 5,000, it says that, that he went off by himself in a solitary place so that he might be able to pray. And then he made his disciples get into the boat. Many of you have heard this before. Matthew, I think, chapter 11. It might be 14. It's somewhere in Matthew. It says, he made them get into the boat, knowing what was going to happen. They were going to have this sea storm and high gale winds, and it was going to perhaps threaten their safety. Why would Jesus make the disciples get in the boat? Because faith is not safe. Faith is difficult. You see, in life I found this progression to be true. One, one time about seven, eight years ago, I was just writing out things on a whiteboard. I love whiteboard thoughts. And I had written, Jesus had embraced his identity. Then he went immediately into trial and temptation. The third thing that happened right after trial and temptation, he had to go through that before he could have ministry. And then as he did ministry, confirmation of who he was started to happen in his mind. And I, and I see that mirrored parallel happen in every other character in the Bible. Identity, trial, ministry, depending on how you failed or how you succeeded or overcame that trial, happens or could happen. And then confirmation of your identity happens. And it's a full circle but it, you cannot sidestep famine. Famine is just a natural part of faith. They're intimately connected. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, now I know you're kind of a knockout. I know you're a beautiful woman and how beautiful you are. And when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife. And then they're going to kill me. But they're going to let you live. So Sarah, why don't you say that you're my sister so that I might be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Sarah is 65 years old at this time. She lives to 127. Now we can't, and we know that based on Genesis chapter 23 verse 1, but we can't really imagine this idea that she is that old that she can even live that long. But let me just give you real quick examples of some stuff. Um, <clears throat> When she walks into Egypt, I think Abraham and Egypt, or Abraham and Sarah understand that the Egyptians are going to see Sarah as being someone different, so she's unique, she's a foreigner, and 65 isn't even that old. It's not even that uncommon to be beautiful at 65, but for this day and age, if she lives to 127, when she's 65, she's actually only middle-aged. She doesn't have any kids. So she is going to be, naturally, a very attractive woman, <clears throat> but I... I Last week, as we started this series, I, I had a friend of mine come up to me, and he starts giggling right after the sermon. He goes, listen, Steve, I, I, I apologize. I checked out on you about 10 minutes in. I said, oh, yeah, why? He said, well, I was, uh, when you started talking about how old these guys were, I tried to figure out how that even works. Because, I mean, is that like, you know, you, you got the verse in the New Testament that says, to the Lord, a, a, a day is a year, and a year is a day. I mean, these guys are like, you said 500 years? Yeah, they're 500 years old. So I just, I kind of went on a, a spur, and I'm sorry. No, that's cool. I said, so something I said made you look in the Bible. I'm all good with that. But I thought it would be worth kind of looking at the fact that this world is a very different world. I, I believe that with all my heart. Uh, there's this thing that first started helping me understand this. In 2004, Terrell Owens had a high, severe ankle sprain. I don't know if you guys remember that play or not. But for the first time in, in, in my life that I could remember, this, this guy who is going to probably be out for six weeks has three weeks to the Super Bowl, and he starts entering this chamber, and he makes this, he makes this statement, and this statement took, it just it kind of took over in media. It says, I feel like I'm a pretty good healer. Believe me, I've already moved my hyperbaric chamber down to my living room. What's a hyperbaric chamber? Today, you can even look in, in like, the, I guess, um, King... Uh, LeBron James, he has a groin injury. Guess what he's sleeping in? He's sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber. A hyperbaric chamber is a micro example of what the old world used to be. The old world was a pressurized system. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 6, we find out that God created the world and that he separates water from water, which means that the old earth was a pressurized canopy. People, when you, when you enter this hyperbaric chamber, what happens is you have extra hydrogen, or I'm sorry, extra oxygen that you're breathing. 
and that reproduces your red blood cells at an accelerated rate. It actually slows aging and it accelerates healing. And that's why athletes around the world today are using in hyperbaric chambers all the time. It's because they realize that, man, there's something special about this hyperbaric chamber. And if that's a micro example of what used to be, to me it makes complete sense that an entire world had people that could live hundreds of years old that we can't live anymore because the world's very different. So I thought it would be good just to kind of look at some of this. When the world changed, I want you to see what happens to the people's names. So go ahead and go to the next slide here, Colin. We start with Noah. Noah's name literally means rest. He lived 950 years. He has Shem. And this is uh, Shem. Uh, he lives 500 years, and his name means name. That's all his name means, okay? Now, we're going to go on. This is kind of where the line is drawn for me right after Shem because the flood happens. Shem's part of the boat. And I love what happens to his next son. It says his son is born two years after the flood. And he names his son Arphaxid. And Arphaxid literally means I failed at the breast. That's a weird name. I mean, like, if you name any of your kids that, that's, you're going to give them some psychological issues, okay? So they walk through, our facts is name, like, what's your name? I failed at the breast. Oh, you too, huh? <laughs> Come here, kids. <laughs> Let's walk away. So our facts it is a weird name, but I think what happens is it's an indication of what's going on in the world. And I think the rest of these, mean, these names mean that because something's different. I think when our facts was trying to nurse, it wasn't working like it used to work. And I think his mom and dad went, something's off. Arphaxid, some years later, has his son named Selah. And Selah literally means sprout, which if you just stop and think about where we're at in the world, I don't think he's nicknaming his kid Sprout because he liked the name. I think literally vegetation is starting to emerge from the earth. And he names his kid Sprout as an indication of what's going on in the world. We talked about Eber last week. Eber is another, it's a root name of Hebrew that we're going to get into a little later because later some foreigners call Abraham Hebrew. And the root of that is one who has crossed from the other side. And that's Eber. Eber has Peleg. During this time in Peleg's world, the world was separated. This is where the Tower of Babel happens. And God comes down and he scatters the nations. We see things in the world are reflected in the names of the people. Now, if you've been scattered from your location, and you all of a sudden can't, t can't speak the same language as someone else, you're going to naturally gravitate to somebody that automatically you have a connection with. If you imagine being scattered from the Tower of Babel, not really know, like all of your friends, you can't talk anymore. You can't speak the same language, but then you bump into somebody that you can speak the same language with. That's going to be a friend for you. You're going to latch onto that individual. You're going to build a community. And that's what happens with Rue. Rue literally means friend. And I believe it happens after the segregation. Or I, I believe that's an indication of what's happened after the segregation. Then Rue has a kid by the name of Sarag. These are he, he names his son not Sprout, but Branches, because now the trees are producing tons of huge branches in the world. And then it goes on. Nahor is named Snor, which I don't understand that. I, can't, I don't know why he named him Snor. But it's Snor. And then Snor names his son Terah, Station. And then Station, or Terah, names his son Abraham. But do you see the progressive nature? 950, 500, 403, 403, 464. And then right after Herb Eber, Peleg, when he's born, he's the last one to live past 200 years old. And you just see a slow decline of the, the longevity of life with man. So Abraham lives 175, Sarah lives 127. She is a knockout, though, at 65. This isn't just a typical 65-year-old. But even in our world, typical 65-year-olds are still very attractive. Let me give you a couple of examples. First one on the, on the screen. Do you know who she is? Vanna White. Who's the second one? Come on. Anyone see it? Jane Fonda. All right. So how old is Vanna White? 62. Probably wouldn't believe that, but she's close to 65. She looks pretty good for a 62-year-old. Jane Fonda, she looks pretty good too. Guess how old Jane Fonda is? 80, who said 81? You're a psycho, you must follow her. I'm, I'm sorry, you're a stalker. No, 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 you're right, she's 81 years old. I mean, she looks really good for an 81 year old. So even in our world today, we see that beauty can happen in age. But here's, here's what I want you to hold on to. Beauty is only skin deep, but ugliness is from the bones. Man, if you're ugly, it goes all the way down to your bone. But here we have a lady. 
Come on. Stay with me. Let me make sure you guys are up. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, you can't do anything about ugly. Anyway, so we have a couple of, we have Sarah, who's this beautiful woman, and Abraham takes note. He's like, hey, they're going to kill me. Now, the reason he says that they're going to kill me is because in ancient times, adultery was a very big deal. They didn't take lightly adultery. In fact, if a couple was found having adultery, if a woman and a man were caught in the act, and down in Egypt, they did a couple of things. One thing that they would do is tie them up and throw them in the river. Okay? You just didn't have adultery with, with each other. Like, if you're married, you're married. You don't, you don't ever step outside that, that line. Another thing that they would do to women specifically is if a woman was caught in adultery, they would literally cut the tip of her nose off and cut off her ears. And the husband usually had to be the one that, that brought the punishment. You see... Adultery was like, the, like it, it was a huge deal, something that we don't even appreciate anymore. And so Abraham knows, man, I, I, they're, they're not going to just like take you and they're not going to just like do things, co compromise you sexually. They're actually going to kill me and then they'll take you sexually, which is kind of a big deal. So he comes up with this plan. He says, say that you're my sister. And in Genesis chapter 20, we find out that Abraham's kind of telling a half truth. But what Abraham was doing was sacrificing his wife to save his own skin. And here's the second lesson that I think we learn. Is if God still considered Abraham faithful, that means for you and I there's hope. Because walking in faith doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. You will make mistakes along the way. You could take a step forward and you might think that you need to take a step right. But you need to take a step left. God still has you. Okay? You don't have to be perfect to be in faith. Now, there's a qualifier there a little bit that we're going to talk about a little later. But you do not have to be perfect. None of us have to be per perfect to come into the presence of God. Okay? Let's keep reading. So, um, in verse 14, when Abraham came down to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman like they had predicted. And then Pharaoh's officials, if you're reading King J, it says princes. And when the Pharaoh's princes saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace put into his harem. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham at this point acquires a ton of sheep and cattle and male and female donkeys and men and female servants and camels. This is kind of like, even in Abraham's unfaithfulness, God is still looking after him. We're going to learn the implications of this later as we read chapter 13. But God blesses Abraham even through his unfaithfulness. Then the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, and he asks him these three questions. I love these questions. What did you do to me? What are you doing? Why did you tell me that she, that she was your wife? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? Now, if you're reading King James, you have an advantage to every other translate reader here. It says, so that I might have taken her. The rest of you have, so that I took her to be my wife. When you read this, you think, oh, shoot, Sarah's sexual integrity has been compromised. In 2 Peter chapter 2, I believe, it says that Sarah was, was honored by Peter for her faithfulness and her obedience to her husband. Even when her husband was making some boneheaded decisions, she still submitted to him. Ladies, let me tell you, your husbands are not perfect. Your husbands aren't going to do it right all the time. Follow Sarah's example. Follow Sarah's example here. Still follow your husband. Because true, true submission, true servanthood, true support looks like that I know that you're going to make a mistake. I'm going to support you in that mistake. And I'll still stand with you and I'm going to help you get things back up. That's what God's called you to. Your husband doesn't have to be perfect for you to follow him. Okay, and we see this here a little bit. But <clears throat> another thing that I, that I find just incredibly fascinating in this is that God has still blessed Abraham in this passage. God is still with him. And when, a, when Pharaoh brings Sarai into the court, there was always this natural process, this natural waiting time where the women had to be purified. So it's very natural and it's, it's highly suspected and almost every commentary I've ever read on this says she was not compromised sexually because of the waiting time that happened. So even God was still being faithful to Sarah. So, 
I might have taken her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and get out of here. Then Pharaoh gave orders to Abram, to his men, and, and they sent them on their way, and his wife and everything he had. What's interesting, just parenthetically, for all of you like geeks in the Bible, this is 430 years after the flood. This event happens 430 years after the flood. You know what happens in the next 430 years? In another 430 years, the same sort of thing happens. Israelite people would be up in the Israelite or in the Egyptian nation, and God would bring plagues and leave them out. So 430, 430, this is a transitional point. This is going to be something that the Egyptians are going to remember way back. So the, the Lord rescues Abraham. He rescues his finances, but more importantly, he rescues his wife. I've given you a lot of different names and what their meanings are, but the thing I haven't given you yet is Sarah's name. You know what her name means? Princess. Literally princess. And I love the redemptive story and the redemptive quality of this passage because it tells us that God is redeeming us, that you are precious to him. You know what Egypt has always translated to in the Bible times? It's always translated to a land of chaos or a land of bondage. And it represents the world. And so you find these people who are living between God and living between hell, living in between heaven and living in between hell, like you and I are constant. We're in this state of transition. We're in this state of tension all the time. And yet, through famine and through crisis, we walk to, towards the world. And you are just like Sarah for God. Our father, which is Abraham's literal, literal meaning, exalted father, comes to rescue his princess, comes to redeem his precious ones. He redeems her right out of Egypt. He redeems Abraham right out of Egypt. Let's look at chapter 14, or 13. So Abraham went from Egypt to Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, that same spot, house of God. The place where, where it was, that was between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had earlier been. And when he had first built an altar to the Lord... And here we have a mirrored passage that was found in chapter 12, verse 8. We see it in chapter 13, verse 4. There, Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. So, there's two more things I want you to hear that I think we learn in this. The first one is he desires progress more than he expects perfection. He desires that you just take another step towards him. The fourth thing that I think we learn is that our positions are oftentimes influenced by our convictions, or influences our convictions. The closer you are to God, the deeper your convictions are going to be. The farther away from God, the more shallow your convictions are. And so as you draw near to the house, as you draw near to the Lord, you're going to have something change inside of you. You're going to have this conviction that you never had before. Food's going to taste differently. Drinks are going to taste differently. Activity's going to be different. The things of this world will grow strangely dim because our position influences our convictions. So those are the four things that I think we learn. Here are the four so what. And I, I kind of tried to do it in an ABC form so that you'd remember these. The first one, the first thing that I think that this like affects our life and it changes our life with is for me, I'm going to start anticipating the famine in my world. I'm not going to be surprised by it anymore. I'm just going to know that the famine might happen. I'm not safe. I don't have a a field of bunnies that I'm looking for. I'm going to anticipate I'm going to be in hard times. If I step out in faith, I'm declaring war on my enemy. So I'm just going to anticipate that there's going to be some hard times ahead. The second thing I'm going to learn is I'm going to be still. I'm just going to rest. I'm not going to be real quick to run towards the world for solution like Abraham did here. I'm just going to be still. Psalm 46 verse 10. I'm going to know that he's God. I know that he's got it. And the third application for me that I'm going to do a little differently is this. I'm going to come back to the altar. I'm going to come back to the place where, and this is our fourth one, that I would call on the name of the Lord. I know some of you are running. Some of you have run to the world for solutions. Some of you have run to, to friends who are not godly for solutions. Some of you have run to other things for solution, and you're coming up empty. And what Jesus is desperate to show you is that you can come back home, come back to the place where you first had faith, and he'll redeem you because you are precious to him. Lord, I pray right now that if there's someone here that has a decision, that's been wrestling with some things, I, I pray that you would ruminate on that. I pray that you would just wrestle them to the ground, that you would break their hip figuratively. Lord, I also just pray that you would um, 
teach them the lessons that you would have them go home with. And if there's somebody that's ready to make a decision today, Lord, I pray that you'd give them strength and courage to jump. Um, more than that, Lord, I pray that we would take your hand, that we just take 11 more steps today. Uh, help us to not quit. Help us to chase progress, not perfection. In Christ's name, amen. trying to hide anything I wear it on my sleeve I wear it on my sleeve I'm not trying to be something I'm not this is all I've got this is all I've got 